Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Cheat Tash. My name is Chris, and today we're going to be talking about Chapter 8 from the book Clean Code by Uncle Bob Barton. Today, talking about boundaries. If you guys remember last time, we talked about Chapter 7, which was all about error handling and using try catches, making sure that you use unchecked exceptions. We talked about returning, or rather, what was the one section? It was using exceptions rather than return code, something I don't think you really see a lot of today, but something that I have done in my code where you return the status code of like the API call. So like if it was a 404, a 500, a 400, et cetera, and then you handle it from there. So what he was saying was it's better to use exceptions, uh, writing out uh, try catch finally statements, and just being cognizant of when you throw exceptions where you eventually catch them and we talked about the open and closed principle in regards to exceptions where as he writes if you throw a checked exception from a method in your code and the catch is three levels ab above you must declare that exception in the signature of each method between you and the catch so basically remember what the open and closed principle meant Things should be open for extension, closed for modification. So if you use checked exceptions, be cognizant of if things change, all the subsequent methods between that and the catch are going to have to change as well, is basically what he's saying. Because when you check an exception, you declare it within the method signature. So that was last time. That was just kind of a small little little uh, highlight of last time. Go check out that episode. Today, we're going to be talking about boundaries, and we're going to go to the first slide here. This will be kind of a shorter chapter. So boundaries. Uncle Bob starts off the chapter by talking about using third-party code. So what is third-party code? This is essentially like the libraries that other developers write and maintain so that then you can import that third-party code into your classes, if I'm looking at this from a Java perspective, and then you can utilize it for your own use. So stuff from like the Java util package. This is stuff that's very common, maps, lists. You know, these are classes that, classes and interfaces or code that other people maintain and that you can utilize for your own benefit in your code. So Uncle Bob says that there's a natural tension between the provider of an interface and the user of the interface. So a tension between the person who writes the map interface and the person who uses it. Providers strive for broad applicability and users want something tailored specifically to their needs. So what do you do? Well, the client's job is to utilize the third-party package in a specific way for their code. So in this example, we're talking about maps. Maps, you got like key value pairs, right? Hash maps. Um, what else is that? Hash maps is the only one I use, but there's tree map, I believe, too. Or just regular maps, etc. So what if a third-party third library changes? And this is where the tension, you begin to see the tension because... It's one thing to just use the third-party library willy-nilly, which you can totally do, but now what if that third-party library changes because, again, other people are maintaining it and developing it, and maybe down the line they could make a major change. And depending on how you implemented that third-party library, your whole entire code base could now change. So Uncle Bob advocates for creating your own class and implementing the third-party library within that class in your own customized fashion in kind of the same way as we talked about in the data structures and objects chapter which was a few episodes ago and definitely go check out that episode if you haven't this is going to be kind of thought about in the same way where you don't want to expose the innards of your objects but you do want to display the data that is pertinent for your users. But you don't want to really explain or give away too much private information about the innards of an object. And that's going to be kind of the same thing in this situation. So 
What Uncle Bob says is you don't want to pass interfaces slash third-party libraries at a boundary. What does he mean by that? Well, you want to keep those inside of a class or close family of classes. You want to avoid those third-party libraries being used by public APIs. And you want to avoid exposing implement implementation-specific interfaces. Instead, what he advocates for is you can use third-party libraries, but use them at your own implementation and use it without interfering with any sort of business logic. So there's an example here that I had of from left to right, top to bottom. This is, yeah, just from left to right we're reading this, or from starting with the left screenshot down and then the right screenshot down. Sorry, not exactly left to right, but on the top you have this key value store, custom interface, which is representing a key value data structure. This is going to be implemented by your hash map store. Okay, so far so good. The hash map store is going to contain the map. This is the Java util map. So within your code, you're going to be referencing this hash map store and not the map itself. Because look in, in this hash map store, it contains an instance variable of a map, right? It's got the public constructor there, default constructor. And then you have your methods here that are being overridden from the key value store interface. And you're utilizing them in your own customized way. Now in this, this is a pretty simple example put get contains key remove these are all these are all existing methods within the map interface but there's a difference in that you are creating your own customized methods that you are going to call on your own customized class instead of the methods put get contains key from the map interface so here in your in your main class, uh, boundary class, you have an instance variable of key value store. You've got the one argument constructor here, which is takes in a key value store variable. What is a key value store? Well, the hash map store, right? So when I go to process data, when I go to process data, I'm calling the methods from the key value store hash map store, right? Because it implements it. And so when you, when, let's just give a hypothetical here. If things change in this map class, then all you have to do is just change this public class hash map store. You don't need to change the business logic over here in the boundary class. That's where the advent, that's where it's advantageous of you to provide your own implementation of the third party library. If you guys follow that, because you could easily say here, oh, map.put, you know, map.get. But then it would maybe be a little more costly if Java releases a new version of the map interface. And that's kind of the main point of boundaries is you want to keep keep implementations or keep the use of third party libraries at a boundary. And that's kind of, I think, what this slide is talking about. Third party code, obviously, it's a huge help, helps us out a lot. But when you're learning about, okay, this was what this slide was about, about learning how to use third party code. And Uncle Bob advocates for essentially doing some like TDD and probably writing some unit tests for the third party code to ensure that you understand how it actually works before just just shoving it in your code cuz he says learning and integrating this can be difficult but you write these learning tests which i kind of consider like test driven development where test driven tdd test driven development where you write the tests first and then you write the code that suffices the test that gets the test to pass so in this it's kind of similar where you write these learning tests where you check your understanding of the third-party library. And the test focuses on what we want out of the library. So this is kind of an example here. If I'm learning how to use uh, log4j from uh, Apache, then I would write some tests that just check, okay, there's this logger.info 
well, we can capture that output and then we can just make sure that it equals, you know, what we what we log.info out. We can test log levels with it, et cetera. And it's just to gain a better of understanding of how the logger works. So learning tests, writing unit tests for third-party libraries to understand how they work before you start just implementing and integrating them within your code. Oops, my bad. So learning tests, again, it's pretty, you know, it's it's easy to do, maybe not, it's well, simple in concept, but maybe not entirely easy to do, especially if there's really complex third-party libraries out there that you're trying to use. But in the end, it ends up costing nothing, says Uncle Bob. So when there are new releases for that library, this is where the real gem of it comes in, is when there are, are new releases for the library, so in, in our previous example, if there's new releases for Log4j, when you rerun those learning tests, when you go to build your Java project, for example, you're going to have the test that will check and make sure that everything still functions like it's like it used to. And you're going to be able to see, hey, if all the tests pass, okay, cool. We don't have to make any changes. But if some of those tests fail, well, now we have a picture and an idea of that particular behavior that we tested and where in the code that that was implemented to know that, oh, we're going to have to change some things in our production code to align with the new behavior of log4j. But there's no guarantee that that behavior isn't going to change, but that's why you write those learning tests so that when the new release does come, you then see for yourself, oh, do we have to make changes or not? Did the behavior stay the same or not? So could potentially be useful. So using code... that does not yet exist. So when creating interfaces, when you do not have access to the public API yet. So this was kind of a story. I'm not gonna go into super detail about it, but it's on page 118, 119, where Uncle Bob talks about a, a little narrative, a little anecdote about when he was working for some company and they didn't have an idea of what the interface was going to be doing yet. That's kind of what I'm describing in the first bullet point. So what they did was they created an interface because they didn't have access to the public API yet. And this was having to do with uh, transmitters. So he writes, we had a pretty good idea of where our world ended and the new world began. As we worked, we sometimes bumped up against this boundary. So the boundary is the public API that they don't have access to. Through mists and clouds of ignorance obscured our view beyond the boundary, our work made us aware of what we wanted the boundary interface to be. So we wanted to tell the transmitter something like this. So they created this transmitter interface, or excuse me, it was a fake transmitter in order to keep from being blocked and in order to define the behavior, what they were expecting in order to just continue along the development of their project. So if you don't have access to public APIs, use inferences on what you think the behavior is going to be to keep you from being blocked, write your own implementation of the API, and that way it's now under your control you write your learning tests, right? And then once the public API becomes available, you can then run the learning test, double check which ones pass, which ones fail, and then adjust your code accordingly. But this way, this keeps you from being blocked. Creating fake interfaces based on your best inference of what the behavior should be. And then once you become unblocked by the availability of that public API, well, now you just plug and play, run your learning tests, see which ones pass, which ones fail, adjust your code accordingly. So there was kind of a small uh, anecdote in the book about that. And summary slide here, guys, uh, good software changes can handle change without huge investments. And if you do end up using public APIs, just ensure that any potential changes in the future won't impact you. And this is where the learning tests come in, making sure that you truly understand the behavior and then you're able to preview the behavior 
before implementing the third party API or the public API. And a little quote from the end of the uh, chapter, it is better to depend on something you can control than on something you don't control. And I think that pretty much sums up this chapter um, very nicely. You want to just make sure that you understand the third party third party API, the third party library that you're using. You hide its implementation so you can better control what the user can or can't see. That way when it comes time to change it possibly, it's a much cleaner transition to the new behavior. And guys, that's going to do it. Uh, thank you guys very much for listening. I know this was a short chapter. Um, next time we're going to talk about unit tests. Appreciate you guys listening. We got the full interview coming out tomorrow with Aaron Sylvanis. He's an entertainment lawyer. That was a very fun interview. Learned a lot about uh, record labels, the music industry. We talked a lot about a lot of different artists. We mentioned Taylor Swift a little bit because there was that uh, Ticketmaster Live Nation lawsuit over a few months a few months ago. So. Yeah, no, guys, thank you very much. Hope you're liking the book, and we'll see you all next time. New interviews coming soon. Thank you guys so much. My name is Chris. This has been Chitash. Take care.